Hi, good afternoon all. Uh, this is Sugandhi uh, from Pioneer. So I am the host for this event. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Pioneer Business Solution. And uh, Pioneer Business Solution, we are hosting this event. And uh, the, I just, uh, before dive into the workshop, uh, I just wanted to give you one small introduction about us, what we do, what we do. Yeah, so this is our uh, glimpse of PBS. So we have, uh, we are majorly into end-to-end -end learning, so learning solutions uh, for across the globe uh, on across the technology. And we do uh, very specialized uh, and well-known in the market for all the clients uh, and meeting their expectation according to their need. And we do provide uh, the services uh, on open house, private batches and public batches. And uh, we do uh, conduct many of the complimentary and free workshops and webinars as well. And uh, majorly, uh, we are present in across the uh, physical and virtual labs. And we also trained more than 10,000 participants across uh, various cutting edge technology. And we do uh, have a more than 1,500 trained and uh, tested trainer database with us. And we have excellent uh, team coordination according uh, according to the all the training, so we'll have a delivery team who can take the take care of the end to end uh, learning process. Yeah, this is about us. So this is our footprints where we support uh, corporate training, information technology, cloud services, HR services, mechanical and civil engineering services. Here, majorly, majorly I'll be handling corporate training, information technology, and HR services. And these are the modes, different modes which we are uh, delivering uh, from the day one. So these are few I uh, have mentioned here. So we have uh, a virtual instructor lead classroom uh, virtual instructor lead training, classroom training, and we do have a hybrid learning, and we have a e-learning and a mentor on demand and open house batches. As I mentioned here, uh, open house batches uh, we have a different uh, and very. Uh, we are well known in the market for that open house batches. So as we are not considering uh, the minimum participant should be eight or ten. So we are considering uh, if minimum three to five participants also. And these topics can be customized as well. And uh, we do provide uh, public batches also. And multiple clients will be getting the nominations for the same. And uh, we have a e-learning so where we can support uh, on the e-learning platform if you wanted to learn any technology we can explore it and we have a mentor on demand post the training you may have faced a few difficulties so here we will pay, play a vital role where we have a, uh, we'll give our uh, expert uh, trainer uh, come SMEs on that particular topic where he will be uh, given only further doubt clarifications. And we have a hybrid learning. Uh, this is bundle of technology, bundle of mode will be coming under this hybrid learning. So uh, either you will be getting hands-on practice, virtual and training plus mentor on demand and uh, cloud lab, everything will be, all this uh, topics will be uh, coming under this hybrid learning. So this is how we are uh, very unique in the market. And we do uh, have customized training according to the client needs. And uh, this is our offerings, campus to corporate competency development training and project consulting. And uh, project consulting uh, is where we will be uh, providing the uh, development consulting. Uh, we will be taking the uh, project. For example, you will be uh, getting some uh, training from your existing clients or from the clients. So where you will be not having internal resources. So at that time, we will be providing the trainer come consultant who is expertized in that subject. So and we have a very successful story on this as well. And uh, we do provide uh, solutions for soft skill behavior development programs as well. So we have a few major uh, topics like design thinking, storytelling on uh, under this. So this is not only for the freshers, but this is from the level one to till the CEO level. We have a uh, training. We will be providing the training services. And this is our uh, we came into the picture now. So this is our uh, client clients which we are working and which we are interacting and uh, this is our major clients and the very happy happy clients i can say and uh, we will meet their expectation that's why uh, and uh, 
uh, this is all about us and uh, I would like to take you to the next slide and uh, I would like to welcome Jitu before uh, diving to this. So thank you Jitu for joining. Uh, thank you Jitu for your time. Uh, for this workshop, uh, this 180 minutes will be productive for all the participants and uh, welcome you all. And we have a Jitu here. Uh, the topic we are hand having a workshop today is advanced Python workshop. And uh, Jitu is a, a MCT Microsoft certified trainer and he's having holding experience of 10 years plus and uh, he's more major expertise in Azure DevOps, Linux, PowerShell, Red Hat and uh, Python, and he delivered many more projects and he handled many more consulting projects as well. And uh, we have uh, our agenda today is introduction of Python. What is advanced Python and why it is required? What will be uh, the impact of th this in real time? How advanced modules in Python can uh, make this easier in life? So this is uh, about our agenda today workshop. And uh, this is a Python open house batch, which we are running, uh, planning to run. So if any participants are interested to learn in depth about Python, please do reach us uh, for the more details we will be providing. And uh, this is a special discount price, which we are giving for the participants who attended today. And uh, the duration, complete duration is five days. And this is only for eight triple nine per participants for entire training. So we'll be providing all the doc training documents and recording and everything. And this is open for private and public patches also. Kindly reach us for more details. Yeah, thank you so much and uh, for your time. Jitu, thank you. Uh, you can take it ahead from here. Thank you. So hello everyone. Good afternoon. This is Jitain Singh Tomar. In short, you guys can call me Jitu. I will be your trainer for uh, today's webinar which is on advanced python so before we proceed further with anything let me uh, clarify let me sh first share my screen so that you will get to know what exactly we are dealing with okay so today we'll be talking about advanced python but before we start advanced python there are a few things which I want to discuss with you, and then we can simply start uh, working uh, on this particular topic. The additional things which we want to share with you, which me and my entire team want to share with you, is today uh, the entire market, if you talk about the entire IT industry, uh, is basically moving towards some sort of automation. Okay. We all have done some sort of manual jobs. We all have done uh, tons of things which basically requires manual job, manual entries and all those things. But nowadays, basically each and everything you talk about any part of your IT industry is basically moving towards the automation. And automation can be done in hundreds of ways. There are several ways. This is not one single way only, but Today we will learn that what is one single way where exactly we can start our automation. Where exactly we can start moving towards the programming part. Now I know most of the people or who are not actually from the uh, computer science background, they are a little bit scared. And frankly speaking, even the computer science people are also scared, including me. Even I was scared when I jumped into the uh, programming and all. I was like, okay, why should I learn programming? Why should I do all those things? But later I realized that yes, we need to have some sort of automation which can actually build up our own career also. If you're working as an IT admin, if you're working as maybe a Windows admin or Linux admin, definitely I can guarantee you if you have not used any automation yet, definitely it's a challenge. Definitely in future you will use it. Maybe in form of PowerShell, maybe in form of shell scripting, maybe in form of Python, it could be anything. But definitely you are going to use this particular tool or I'm talking about the entire automation part. So today we will be talking about one single entity that is Python in this entire automation. OK, that is first thing. Second, after finishing this entire uh, webinar today, 
see this particular webinar is gonna be theoretical and practical okay don't worry don't skip if you do not know how to do programming if you know it's very good if you don't know that's fine okay but by the end of the session at least you will be having some confidence that yes you will be able to work with this particular python technology okay so what i have done in the end is i have created some scripts some bonus scripts which is not added in the toc but actually that will help you a lot how it is going to help you why it is going to help you in the end only i'll show it to you okay and believe me whoever is working from home it is going to be a very big tool for those people it's not like it is not going to be useful for the uh, for your uh, company's campus environment or something like that no but especially it is for the people who are working working from home so please stay tuned with me next thing we all have connected today to basically get some sort of certification okay sorry certificate certificate that you have attended so and so uh, webinar okay you have attended so and so python advanced uh, advanced python uh, webinar you have attended you need a certificate for that but everything has its own cost it is not gonna be for free today i will be sharing some questions with you guys and whoever will be answering them and will be reverting the actual solutions to us will be definitely getting the certificates in the end okay so please make sure that you understand each and everything okay those questions are very 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 simple those questions are completely uh, on what exactly we will be dealing with today uh, today's content today's topic so please do not skip anything you have to understand the logic which is very easy i have tried my best to make sure that each and every person doesn't matter you are from programming background or non programming background you should be able to understand that okay and for submission we'll be giving you 15 to 20 days of time uh, we know that you all are it people we you all have some sort of job but five questions are there 15 days of time i think it will be more than sufficient for you guys to respond on those particular questions okay so this is all about the introduction which i wanted to give based on the today's content now let's start with what we have to actually see today so today's agenda for this entire session will start from the introduction part basically what python is why python is required what are the major advantages of learning python if you don't know you don't know what python is yet then we will be jumping on to some of the data manipulation uh, techniques how you can manipulate your data how you can store your data how you can work with your data how you can extract it how you can transform it how you can simply uh, present the data on the output screen then we'll be talking about some of the oops concept object oriented programming which is very major part of your python programming so this all is basic of python then we'll be jumping on to the advanced level where we'll be talking about the web scraping now this is web scraping if you don't know it's a basic uh, mechanism where you extract data from a particular website it could be any website okay but web scraping code changes from site to site like for example if i am searching for uh, photos on google maybe there is a like there is a, a very popular website from where you download the images for free that is unsplash you need to download multiple images and you want to use them in any way how you are going to do that maybe you want to find out what exactly uh, is the current product and its price for a particular uh, for a particular industry or you want to do some shopping and you want to know okay on amazon or flipkart what is the current price using the automated method i'm talking how exactly you can fetch the data how you can simply extract web related data and then simply perform it or simply view it or use it in your own code okay this looks quite critical but it is actually very easy then we'll be talking about the data visualization so if you are from uh any 
management level background so definitely you must be running some sort of presentations in presentation definitely we use some uh, charts or plots or something like that some visual graphics we want in the ppt how you can use your programming skills to basically get that particular visualized data automatically okay manually again it can be done i'm not denying you cannot do it manually you can open paint or any other draw.io or whatever website you want but we are talking about the live data update how the data will change and how the diagram is going to change if if my data just assume that my data is changing uh, 10 times a day or 100 times a day or 1000 times a day obviously i'm not going to sit every time and then do the same job same editing job again and again on photoshop or anywhere else so how actually you can get the dynamic data with the help of visualization and then we will jump on to the sorry, we will jump on to the machine learning track okay so you might have heard of this term called ai ml artificial intelligence and machine learning this is the future now and if you are thinking that you should work uh, start working on any of these technologies let me tell you one thing that you need python to basically jump onto these specific technologies now it's not mandatory that you have to be a very good expert in python if it is if you are an expert then very good otherwise even if you have the overall knowledge basically if you know how to deal with some of the modules if you know how to deal with the libraries then it is going to be very easy for you to understand and work on those technologies so we'll start with uh, introduction now here in this entire webinar i don't want to run only the theoretical part i know we all feel sleepy when uh, we see too much of theory and all so what i have done basically i have uh, created several scripts for you guys which i will explain what exactly that entire script is doing no need to write it down no need to take the screenshots after the training is over after the session is over my team will be sharing an email with you where you can have the download link for these scripts you can use them as you want in whatever way you want you can completely use them there's no problem with that okay so i'll be sharing each and every script whatever i will be sharing on the screen over here today with you guys okay so I have designed this entire uh, webinar in such a way that you should be able to understand. We will not be wasting time in writing the code, okay? But if you know what the code is doing, then it is gonna be quite easier for us to actually understand that particular language, that particular programming language, okay? So in this particular module, we'll be starting with what Python is, basic syntax, control flow, functions, and modules okay now when you start learning any technology i hope you have uh, a knowledge on any like if you have any knowledge on any programming uh, language can you give a yes in the chat window do you know any language c c plus plus java Perl, python ruby sql whatever it is okay i can see so many yes in the chat perfect perfect thank you thank you for your response that's it thank you so much cool so now basically you know that what exactly is happening over here okay so we'll be starting with the complete basics that what exactly python is how you can use it and then slowly we will be moving towards how you can use that in your day to day life. OK, so basically when you talk about Python, it is a high high level programming language. Basically, see why I learned uh, why, why I started learning Python was a very simple reason. C, C++ was very difficult for me. I never understood Java to be very frank. OK. I knew how to work with C and C++, but I never understood really how to deal with Java and its uh, syntaxes and so many other things. 
if you want to print a simple hello world program in c language hardly it is going to take uh, four to five lines minimum it is going to take four to five lines the same thing the same thing in python can be done with one single line so agenda was very clear why should i write five lines when i can do the same thing in the single line over here okay so that is a big problem if you if you want to write multiple lines see when you write the pro, uh, project code when you write the production level code it is not going to be five lines or 10 lines the code the, the number of lines for a particular code can go up to 2000 3000 10000 20000 line of code also but when you write all these things and you know that there is okay Okay. Sorry. So here, basically, this particular uh, technology or this particular programming language will tell you that you can write the same code, means the output is going to be same, but in a very less number of lines. So if you are using C or C++ or Java and your number of, if you look at the number of lines, it is going somewhere around 10,000, just, just a hypothetical number I've taken. Okay. And you take the same program and then try to write it in the Python. I can assure you that the same thing, same output you can get. Maybe in 4000 lines or 5000 lines of code, depending upon what logic you have implemented, but definitely it is going to be less than what we have. OK. So this is the major reason why Python is very much booming, or you can say it is uh, having uh, too much of reputation in the market. Now, when you talk about writing the code, Python is very easy to read and write. OK, so someone is asking in the chat uh, regarding the Python installation. OK, guys, if it is not clear how to basically install Python, it is quite simple. OK, no need to uh, think too much. What you can do is you can simply go to uh, go to python.org. You can go to this particular site. And here we have the download option over here. And you can simply click on download for Windows if you are having Windows. If you are having Linux or Mac OS, then you can check the entire download code or you can simply write if you are using uh, Linux specifically. Uh, Red Hat or uh, CentOS, then you can simply write yum install and Python 3. Python 3 is the latest version which you should install and then simply work with that. Okay. So basically, Python installation might be slightly different for different operating system, but once it is installed, it works exactly in the same manner. OK, so it is very simple how you basically install. A particular Python uh, utility, Python uh, executable file on your Windows machine or Linux machine and then simply play around with that. OK, so basically here when you talk about Python. Python uses indentation for the coding. What is the best open source ID for Python? Now, this is a very interesting question, guys. Which is what is going to be the best IDE? Basically, ID stands for. Can anyone reply what exactly IDE stands for? Come on, guys. I'm expecting some answer. Exactly. Very good. Integrated development environment. OK, cool. So basically when you talk about IDE, IDE is nothing but a simple uh, place where you will be writing your code. <laughs> now, if you are running your code for the very first time, because we got a question that how to install it, that means people are not aware of it completely. That's completely fine. If you have started or if you are starting your career in Python, then I will suggest that you use IDLE environment in your 
system which is by default available if you after installation if you type i d l e you'll get something like this okay so basically you can start this entire uh, utility on your system and you'll get something like this and you can start writing the code over here by default if you already if you know uh, if you are working with any of the uh, other programming language and you want to switch to python then there are multiple IDEs which can help you out. There is something called as PyCharm. There's something called as Jupyter. There's something called as VS Code Editor. VS Code Editor is something which is very, uh, very much famous nowadays between the developers. Okay, so even I, uh, for the practical uh, purpose, even I have used VS Code Editor. You have to just install Python on your machine. You have to install the Python extension on your VS code and you are ready to go. OK, so basically. There are multiple IDEs that can be used. Very famous Jupyter VS code editor. These are the two which I have practically worked on and which basically helps you a lot. OK. Now. Is VS Code Editor is on this Google Studio? No, uh, hurry. VS Code Editor is basically if you write on Google, download VS Code Editor, it will give you the direct download link from the Microsoft website, and from there you can basically use it. Guys, uh, before I proceed further, I liked one thing over here. Let me appreciate that and then we can move on. One thing is that even though your mics are off, even though you are just listening to me, you are also asking the question. It is a very good sign. Please interact. It should be a two way communication. You should be you are investing three hours over here. OK, so those three hours should be fruitful. You should get something in the end. So don't think that what other person will think when you ask a particular question. OK. We all are. Uh, we all have turned off the camera, so simply you can ask whatever you want. No one is going to uh, analyze that who asked so in the question. OK. Now, next thing is when you talk about Python, basically Python helps you. Python basically works on the indentation part. So basically, when you write a code in C or C++, you remember you have to uh, uh, create those braces, you, those brackets, some opening bracket and then something like this closing bracket. OK, so you write your code between these brackets over here. In Python, we don't have that particular concept. Because in C, C++, most of the time you'll be wasting your energy in identifying, OK, I have opened these many brackets. So I have to close these many brackets also. In Python, there is no problem of the brackets only. OK, it is all about how good. You have intended your entire program. OK, the indentation is very important when you talk about the Python program. I'll show you how basically it works out in, in some time. And when you talk about extension, if you're working on for example, C program. So you save your script as hello world.c. If it is C, hello world.cpp. If it is Java, hello world.java, and so on. In the same way, Python scripts are saved as .pyc. Okay. So whenever you see the extension .py in that particular manner, it is just you have to understand that, okay, this is a Python script. Now, When you talk about Python features, there are several features which makes Python very interesting. OK, as I told you, it, it is easy to read, easy to learn. OK, Python is the actually it is the easiest language to read and understand. OK, there are n number of reasons. All of them cannot be explained or elaborated over here, but just for now understand that. Python is the easiest to learn to understand because 
here actually you are writing more english okay you are writing more english related things which is making your job much easier okay next is it is an interpreted language then you have cross platform compatibility cross platform basically stands for when you have uh, the same code and then you run it on multiple platforms okay then it is having a standard large library so basically python is also uh, there's a very famous quote for python uh, there's a very famous quote for python which generally is used almost every time it comes with battery or you can say battery included. Generally, this is the term which we use when we are explaining uh, the features of uh, Python. The reason why you say this particular term batteries included in Python is there are very large number of libraries that you have to just call and start using. It. So let me take a simple example. If you are from programming background, it will be easier for you to understand. In any of the programming language, C, C++, if you want to create some sort of data structure or you want to create some sort of uh, uh, location where you want to hide some data or do anything, for that you have to start building your code from the beginning. From a complete zero level, you need to build each and everything. When it comes to Python, you have to just invoke or you have to just call that particular library onto your machine and it is all good to go. There are multiple uh, uh, libraries available which will basically help you out in performing anything and everything that you want. OK, if you want to work with data structure, there is a library for it. If you want to work on the data visualization, there is a library for it. You want to work with AI and ML, there are libraries for it. So basically, you don't have to do everything from scratch. Libraries are already available. You have to just use them as modules and then start working on it. So basically, that will help you out in understanding how the Python program works out. Third party packages are there. So basically, Python has a, a vibrant uh, ecosystem with vast uh, support for third party libraries also. OK, so you might have heard of something called as NumPy, Pandas, uh, TensorFlow. These are the third party uh, packages which you can simply install and work with that. Then OOPS concept is implemented in Python. So basically Python supports object oriented programming that basically allow the developers to reuse the code or the module which you have created. OK, with the help of uh, some <clears throat> object oriented concepts like classes, objects, uh, inheritance, polymorphism, all those OK, and it is dynamic typing. So basically Python uses dynamic typing, which means that you don't need to declare the data type. Like if you remember in C language, we used to write int a equals some number like 10. So what you are doing, basically you are defining, you're declaring that the variable a is going to be an integer type. OK, in Python, you don't have to do that. You don't have to waste your time in uh, elaborating all those things again and again. And moreover, the same thing, <laughs> the uh, C, C++ languages, these are not having uh, in-depth. So you have to basically use them like you want to work with very limited number of variables and you don't want to declare so many variables. You can simply use them in very easy way when you talk about the Python. Now, when you talk about variables, OK? So basically, when you start writing a code and you simply write, you, you want to write some variables over here. You want to make sure that, OK, your uh, your content is getting stored in your Python program. How does going to happen? So basically, we, we basically use the variables in Python to store the uh, data, OK? And when you talk about variables, it can save any type of data that you want. It could be integer, it could be number, it could be floating type means it could be in, in form of uh, decimal. 
OK, so that will help you. Someone asked that, OK, what does it mean? Interpreted language interpreted language in Python is what uh, basically executes the code line by line without explicitly compiling the entire application. So basically this allow you to uh, quickly prototype your entire uh, environment. OK, so when you talk about interpreted language, basically you go for line by line of uh, interpretation and that makes your code or that executes your code much faster. OK. Now when you talk about Python basics, so there are several basics that you should be knowing. OK, some of them are basically if you talk about the categorization, there are two categories, uh, data, uh, data types and operators over here. OK, when you talk about data types specifically, there are multiple data types available. There are multiple data types available in Python, which can basically hold different types of values. OK. Being a developer, you could be. Savana, sorry, will you share this PDF? Guys, I told you clearly that I will be sharing each and everything, whatever is getting displayed here on the machine on my screen over here. PPT in, in form of PDF questions, which I have asked you that, OK, if you finish that, you will be getting the assignments, uh, sorry, the certificates, then the scripts which I will be running each and everything will be bundled and it will be uploaded in GitHub. And from there you can simply download it without any without paying anything. So don't worry, it is all cost uh, free of cost for now. <laughs> OK, so let's come back to the data types. Basically, data type is something which, which stores different types of data. Now, maybe I have a requirement where I have to store uh, integer type of data. Maybe there is a requirement where I have to only uh, store whether the output is going to be true or false. OK, so depending upon what exactly you want to store in your machine, based on that, you can simply use that kind of data type on your machine. Now, when you talk about the data types, here we have the first one as numeric data type. Numeric data type basically uh, contains three different types of uh, uh, data types inside it. That is going to be uh, integer, float, and complex number. So if you store a number, let's say A equals 10, so that 10 is going to be your integer data type. You want to store value of pi, pi, e pi equal, uh, sorry, pi equals to 3.14. We all know the value of pi up to an extent, it is 3.14. So this is going to be an uh, floating integer, uh, floating uh, data type. OK, you want to work with some sort of mathematical calculation and you need a complex number for it. 3i uh, plus uh, 3 plus 5j, something like that. OK, so they, these things, these different uh, data types can be stored under the numeric data type. So when you have to store your Boolean data types like true or false, then in that way you can simply use the Boolean data type. You want to store a string, we have a string data type. You want to uh, store the list. Now this is interesting. List is basically the ordered collection of an item. OK, you can simply use any number of items inside a list that will basically make sure that each and everything is getting stored under one single element. That element is nothing but the list. Then we have tuples. So when you have to basically go for the immutable data storage, then we go for tuples. Then we have dictionary. You have key value pairs. OK, and then we have sets. Sets are nothing but the unordered collection of items, unique items. So here we are just talking about these particular things, but practically we will be working on each and every element which has been shown over here, and we will be using these elements in our program later on. So at least you'll be able to understand, okay, this is how basically the code works. This is how basically it works out over here. Okay. Now. 
so when you talk about the conditional uh, control flow so control flow basically decides how your program is gonna get executed okay you are controlling the entire flow of your execution okay so when you talk about control flow there are basically multiple things like if else statement you want to check if so and so thing is true then only work or then only work for that particular component okay but in this particular case what will happen multiple ifs will be written that will increase unnecessarily the length of your code so we have another thing that is if else or nested if else you can say or if l lf statements there are multiple things that can be used over here so basically nested if else or if else statement will perform this check on multiple levels okay then you have loops when you have uh, multiple uh, things or iterative things to perform inside your code then at that particular time we go for the loops then in that case we have for loop and while loop then you want to verify okay at, at a particular certain level i need to break my loop okay loops cannot go infinitely right so we need to break it sometime okay so you want a part when it reaches a particular level then at that time let's uh, close that particular loop so at that time break will be uh, executed similarly we have continuous statement when you want okay if so is the condition is met do some job and then again continue okay something like that then pass when you just <clears throat> when you are just writing the code and when you, exactly you don't know what my code should be doing then in that case you can just simply pass the pass parameter and your code will be executed without showing any error okay so when you talk about function now function is something which basically is used or you can in 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 easier terms you can say reusable block of code means you can use you can reuse a certain code multiple times okay means you have written some code and then you want n number of time you should use that particular code to perform so in so job then in that case functions are best usage in your program to write a particular function basically there are multiple steps we define a function then we define the parameter return values and all those things okay these all can be used under one single program or you can use di different level of uh, uh, scopes over here and then simply play around with them functions are the simple code which will basically help you in minimizing your code means it is it is basically used for code optimization you can optimize your code up to an extent and basically uh, use functions then you have modules so basically modules are the code the python code where you have already defined if you are talking about your own customized module then in that case you can simply uh, like okay let me take a simple example i have created several functions like for example adding two numbers or just like a calculator add subtract multiply divide and so on okay i have done this and i don't want to rewrite the same thing again and again why should i rewrite and increase my code length in that case what i can do the code which i have written prior this calculator code i can just call this as a module into my program and then simply play around with that simple okay so it's not mandatory that you have to use everything under one single file only you can write multiple files multiple lines in different files and then you can simply call them the same concept can be implemented for the third party modules also the modules which i was talking in the beginning numpy uh, uh, tensorflow and so many are there what those people have done they have simply created code for you guys and then you are simply using that code on okay so that is how basically it works out now let's jump on to the demo it's too much of theoretical part let's see what uh, we have to see uh, what we have in the demo part 
So here, if you look at this screen, so basically this is what I have done in entire uh, uh, for this entire webinar. I have created multiple modules. Each module is having its own code because even you can understand in three hours of time, learning and understanding a particular technology cannot be done in the complete, like it cannot be done in three hours. That is for sure. Okay, someone says. Okay, the audio is the audio problem is not from my end, guys. Uh, check your internet connectivity, please. Okay, thank you for the confirmation. Preeti is asking, how did you created this module? Uh, Preeti, these module, these, these are the modules which we are running based on the TOC which has been shared uh, with you guys. Okay, those modules are listed over here. Module one is all about the basics. Okay, like variables, data types, control flow function, and module. Then module two is all about list tuples and other things. Module three is all about uh, the oops concept module four is all about web scraping module five is all about visualization and six is all about machine learning ml okay so those are the modules which i have uh, created people are asking to increase the font size sure guys just give me a second Okay. Guys, one thing someone asked, can you possibly change the background to white? Okay, let me tell you one major rule which all the developers follow here. We love the black. Okay, but still I'll try to change it because from the day I have installed it from that day till now, I've never ever uh, changed it to uh, white so let me find the option for it okay and meanwhile people are asking how uh, you're using this in specific here no uh, basically you can use any vs code version that is not gonna uh, be a problem okay that's not gonna be a problem I hope the fonts are now visible. I hope now it should be visible to all properly. Guys, please acknowledge if the audio and video both are clear to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Okay, cool. Now, so these Python scripts, I am using my VS Code editor where I have created all the programs and other things. Okay, it is just simple like this module which you are which we are talking. This is actually a folder. Okay, if I go to my E drive, and if I go to let's say where is that? Where's the location? E Python. Okay. So you can see here, these are the folders which uh, which I have created here, and each folder contains multiple scripts inside it. Okay, so this is what I have done as of now. See, everything cannot be taught in three hours of time span. I, I hope you can understand that. So that is the reason I tried creating all those things prior before working on it but definitely if you have no idea let me tell one thing very clearly over here don't worry if you even have no idea about that if we have any other webinar in future for python or you join us for any of the open house batches for python definitely we'll go through each and everything i'll be telling each and every uh, step from the scratch itself even which uh, webs from which website I need to download so and so uh, package or whatever I have done. Each and everything will be done from the beginning, OK? And if you are concerned about, OK, if you have no idea how to start it, so let me uh, make this make this uh, easy for you. After the session is over, I will give you step by step uh, procedure if you want to actually start working on Python, OK? like how from where you can download uh, the utility from where you can download the uh, IDE for your uh, program. Some people uh, are thinking why G2 is only using VS Code. VS Code is something which, see, I personally work with multiple programming languages. I work on shell scripting. I work on PowerShell. I work on Python. I work with uh, Terra, uh, Terraform. I work with Ansible. OK, so basically my flavors changes from time to time. And I needed one single utility which can solve all these problems. Because for every programming language, there is a certain ID already available. So I don't want to overburden my machine. That is the reason I am using VS Code Editor. Now, let's come back to the program. So this is a simple Python script, a Python code where I have written just two single lines. OK, I've just written where equals and some data over here. OK, now this is not mandatory that I have to write only this particular line. It could be anything. It could be anything that you want. OK, and then I'm using a simple print statement to basically print my data. Now this is not mandatory that even to print the data, I need to have two lines and then only it is gonna work out. I can simply go for this also. Okay, so I'll comment this out. Comment is created by hashtag in Python. Comments are nothing which will basically hide the code from the interpreter, Python's interpreter, and it is for your understanding. Okay, you being a developer, you have to. It's I think it is my personal uh, point of view that you should use comments. OK, so when you leave the organization or when like, for example, if you are looking at your old code, which you have written possibly three years ago, two years ago and so on, then in that case. Comments are going to be very easy and very uh, it is going to be very helpful for you. So if you look at the code which I have created, for example, let's say. Uh, see here. Now if you want to work with this data visualization part. If you start running the program. Definitely it will fail on your machine. Why it will fail? Because you have not executed these code. So clearly. So clearly I can add. 
data or it could be anything okay so it it is something like let's say g2 is taking this webinar on 5th july so it could be anything it could be technical stuff it could be non technical stuff it is all in your hand so later on if i get to okay okay uh, maybe on so and so uh, month i have worked on so and so code but i can't remember it properly i can simply come back and then read this comment and okay this is a webinar code which i have displayed so not to use in the production lab so these these this is the simple usage of your comments someone is asking how to add colors to comment uh, see this is uh, a question which will change from the uh, ide to ide i am using vs code editor so vs code basically changes the code here in green color if you are working on idle which i told you in the beginning okay idle that will have red color uh, comments over here okay so it all depends what exactly you want it always depends on like let's say this is a sample code and i'll just print hello world okay simple so here it is showing the data in the commented data in the red color so colors don't run behind the color okay so because the moment you change your uh, uh, the moment you change your ide see it's not mandatory that if you are working on vs code ed editor so your production is also working on the same thing no it's not mandatory so you have to think about the code not for the ide here okay now coming back to track so here now if i want to write the same thing in c so i have to write hash include conio.h hash include stdio.h then void main bracket start print statement and then bracket close hardly 5 to 6 lines of code i had to write in order to get my hello world to print my hello world in python i just need this one single line and i'll simply run it over here like this see i just needed one single line over here okay so it is not at all mandatory that you have to write tons of code then only you will get what exactly you want python basically reduces your load on you okay whatever you are thinking that it can be done cannot be done python will make sure that the same thing can be achieved but in much simpler manner over here okay so this is a simple example of what exactly python can do if you want to use a variable over here then in that case you can simply replace this like this and then run it over here and you can see i'm getting the same code over here so here i am using this single line then also i am getting this and i am using two lines over here then also i am getting the same output over here so it is all up to you it is all your logic with the help of which you can simply play around with all these things next when we talk about data types so i told you that there are multiple data types available right so when we basically talk about the first one numeric data type okay so it is just like an integer you have just return some random name uh, my, uh, random age my age equals 30 now see here if you look at this particular statement this line number 4 over here nowhere i have declared that it is going to be an integer or float or whatsoever it is i just wrote what exactly i want and then i'm simply printing the type okay now see here if you are using c c++ or other language you have to find out a way or you have to use some sort of different format to find out what kind of data type it is having but python is having its own 
function called type which basically declares the type of the variable that you are using. So when I run only these two lines, I've selected these two lines I'm, and, and, and I'm gonna execute shift and enter. You can see here it says it is gonna be or it is the integer class, integer type. Same way here I have added value of pi 3.14. If you guys know you can write the entire number. I'm OK with 3.14. That's what I remember as of now. OK, so if I simply run only these two lines now, here you can see it identified that OK. It is your floating type. Then if you have a complex number to represent, then you can simply use this method and then run it and here it is going to be your complex number. You can print the number also, but it is going to work out exactly in the same way how this code worked out. So whatever you are storing, you are just printing that. But here my concern is, can it print the data type also? So yes, this is what we are doing. Now when you talk about the Boolean, so basically I told you that in Boolean we have the true false type. Okay. Like how you work, uh, how you work with zero and one. In the same way, we are working up, uh, working on the true and false over here. Now, when you talk about is active equals true, when I do this, okay, I'm I'm taking only this line eighteen and then line twenty because that will print what exactly I want the data type. So you can see here it understood that it is a boolean type. Then if I check for again is stopped. In the same way, if I print the data type of it, it is also only. So you can see here nowhere I have declared what type of data I am going to use, but Python is quite intelligent. It understood that OK, based on the value, it identified that what kind of uh, what data type it is using and then basically it is printing that data. Now if you have some sequences like strings and all, so you can see it is the str. str stands for string. Then you have list. List basically uh, is created in Python with the help of these brackets. Do not get confused with the brackets over here. Okay. Now if you are having a question that Jitu you told in the beginning that we don't create the brackets but now you're using the bracket over here in Python. So we don't use brackets to define the scope of your uh, function or module. But in order to declare list, then in that way you have to use the square bracket over here. If you change the bracket type, the meaning also gets changed. Okay, so you have to be careful with that. So when I run these two lines only, it says it is a list. In the same way we have Dictionary available. Dictionary is basically key and value. What is the key? Key here is name and designation, and values are Jitendra, that's my name and designation, my uh, sorry, a trainer, my designation. When I run these two and check the data type, it simply says dict, stands for dictionary. And the same way, set, frozen, and all those things work out over here. OK, so basically this will tell you how exactly. The, the entire code works out the entire. Uh, uh, output works out. Or different data types will be helpful in your Python program. OK, now when you talk about the next part that is. See guys, this is the reason why I have uh, created the scripts before only because showing these many things in limited number of time span is quite difficult. OK, that is the reason simply I've taken all these things in advance. Now here when you talk about the control flow, so initially we, we spoke about if statement. Now here you can see X equals minus four. It is having a negative value. And if you look at this particular statement, this print should not be actually printed because this is a negative number and here it is showing it is positive. So when I run this value, so you can see there is no output. There is no output. 
If you see here dotted lines, this is the code which got executed. Okay, but actually there is no output over here. But when I simply use the if else statement, I, I can write simply one more over here like, okay, if X is less than zero, then basically do whatever you like. I, I can do that, but unnecessarily it is increasing the code length, which I don't want. Okay, so that is the reason simply what I did basically. I have declared everything under this particular. Now we know that it is going to be the answer is going to be X is negative. Let's see what we get. Here. You can see. If I change this to positive 5 or let's say positive 35. OK. Run it and now it says it is. Positive. So basically it is your logic programming in programming. You cannot follow one single rule that someone has already written the code. So I, even I have to write the same thing in the same manner. No, not at all. It is your code. It is your mind. You have to use it. You have to write it simple. OK, so you have to make sure that whatever logic you are implementing will it should be. For code optimization. Now, so when you talk about nested defense, you can see here we have stated the if statement. If this is not true. Instead of writing else, we are using elif. Which is basically for verifying other condition. Now why we are writing this? Imagine. If I execute this particular number, but here if I write a zero. OK, or any other number which does not match this statement or any other statement also, then what will happen? OK, then in that case we need some sort of additional value, something like this. And now when I run the code, you can see it clearly says X is zero. If I go for 10, for example, and then rerun the same program, it says it understood that OK, the value is greater than 10. If I go for negative and then rerun the same thing, it says it is negative. So depending upon the value which I am adding, even by the way, you can add this code dynamically using the input command. So here, depending upon the value that you are uh, passing, my program is changing. OK, then you talk about loops. OK, so we have for loop now. I hope you must have remember uh, the for loop. In your C, C++ where you specify three different conditions and then you write the code inside it. But check this out. I have not mentioned anything apart from these two lines. And still when I run these three lines, this is the data or the list which has all the uh, technologies name in it. And then I'm going to just print those names over here. So when I select this and then run it, you can see here I'm getting my data over here. Simple, right? So basically, you don't have to write their entire. OK, if you are not sure, this is the old method of writing the for loop in your C, C++. For then you write something like int. A equals sorry. The most famous one int i equals zero. OK, then. I. Let's give some something. And I plus plus then you write the code something like this. So you must remember some something like this over here where you initialize the variable, then you provide the condition and then you either increase it or decrease the data or, or this particular value over here. And if this entire these two things are true. Then in that case. The code written inside this will be executed, but if you look at the Python's for loop nowhere, we have mentioned these curly brackets. These curly brackets I have not mentioned anywhere, but if you look at this statement, you can see there is a space over here. If you remember in the beginning of the slides, I told you that Python is totally dependent on the indentation that you have 
used in your code. Just now you saw that the code is working and I'm getting some output over here. Let's try to break this rule and try to run the code now. The moment I remove all the spaces, see now there is a red underline under print. OK, that means there is some sort of problem. And if I hover my mouse on top of it, check what what prompt I'm getting indentation error expected and intended block for block after for statement on line 30. So even you have no idea what exactly the problem is. Python is basically telling you, boss, this is the problem. OK, then also you ignore everything and then try to run the code. Then you get the same output over here. And it is showing. Check this out. Check the error also. What else you want, boss? See. It is telling you where the problem is. It is telling you what the problem is. This is the beauty of Python. OK, so basically. You don't have to think too much when you write a Python code. Obviously, you have to think when you're writing a logic. For that, nothing can be done, but definitely. This is going to be very handy when you write multiple codes or when you write too much of code over. In the same way, now check this out. So here what is happening? for loop is done. Now talking about the while loop. So when you talk about the while loop, when you simply run this, see what happens when I run the code. So what happened? This basically code gets initialized at zero. And it is checking while X is less than five. Means keep running the code until the value of X is lower than five. Then in that case, what will happen? It will start printing. So initially 0, 0 less than 5, true. Print it, increase the value by 1. 0 plus 1 equals 1. So 1 is less than 5, so it is printing the data. The moment it reaches 4, it will print 4 and then it will increase the value by 1. 5 less than 5 statement goes as false. Then it comes out of it. Simple. So there are multiple ways to basically iterate your job in whatever way. But it all depends on what kind of logic you are implementing over here. Then when you talk about the break statements, if you look at this code over here, again, I'm using the same list AI, ML and Python. And what I'm doing for T in tech, if the tech equals Python, then break it. So when I run this code, see. It prints AI, it prints ML, but it doesn't print Python. Why? Because the mo what I told, if the moment you find Python, simply break the code. Simple. So when you use these small, small logics and then you implement them, it is going to be very helpful for you. Okay. Now, when you talk about the functions, now when you talk about functions over here, check. OK, next module or next topic is function. So basically this is how you define a function in Python. OK, you write the keyword DEF. Then you write a function name. Function name could be anything. Function name could be anything. It's not mandatory that you have to write exactly greet only. It could be anything. OK. Now, when you basically run this entire code over here. OK, here exactly what you're doing. You are just storing this function in your program, uh, in your RAM. OK, this particular code is getting executed in or getting saved in your RAM. It will not be executed until and unless you call the program. So this is basically the definition of your program, and then this is the function for it. OK, so now see here. I have not written function calling over here. So another beauty of using comments. I can give multiple spaces over here. Hit. Hit a. Uh, hashtag. And then you can simply write. Function calling. Still the data is in green color over here. 
Why it is in green color? Simple thing. It is a comment. So even if I run this entire code, still you can see here, nothing is affected. It is just showing the same thing over here in the in the code compilation over here. Okay, and even I can ignore that and then run only this much. Then also I'll get the program over here. Sometimes you have to write multiple lines and you need to run all of them at, at once. Okay, possibly the commented code also gets executed, but it will not impact the output that you have. Okay, so these kind of functions, uh, these type of comments can be simply added to your code, which will basic, basically help you in future. Now, this is a simple greeting function, which is just printing some data. Okay, it could be any data that you want. Okay, so right now it is showing welcome to the world of Python. Let me change it to welcome all by PBS, something like that. PBS is basically Pioneer Business Solution. And when I simply run this code and check, it exactly works in the same manner. OK. Now, when you talk about. Parameters, so if you see here, there's no parameter getting passed to this particular function, so it is just doing what is defined inside it. Whatever is defined inside this particular function, only that will be executing. So I can use this if I want to greet. In this particular static way only. I want some dynamic content should be added. So what I can do, let's say, OK, here I have a function that is passing the name called Jitendra. So when I run this particular code and then simply execute it, it says hello Jitendra. OK, and if you basically let me comment this line because I don't want this line 11 should be executed, but I want to pass G2 this time. So when I run it now, so this time it says hello G2. OK, so this is how basically you can. Pass multiple values in whatever way you want. OK, now if you look at this data over here, you can see defining at the def keyword, then there are some spaces and then my actual data got started over there. OK, so if you're thinking that, OK, how many spaces should I give over here? Let me show you what exactly happens when you use an IDE. So let's say def uh, welcome and now see, I've just hit enter and automatically it reached over there. I don't have to define how many spaces I want. Your IDE will take care of that. This is the reason why we have why we should use IDs. This is the reason. OK. So let me show you again. This is how I create a function and I'm just going to hit enter. See. Ideally, if you do the same thing in notepad, for example. If you do the same thing in notepad and then hit enter, see. There is no indentation. OK, just below this D, my cursor is moving and from here only I have to write or additionally what I have to do hit tab button and then do my coding. OK, now whatever comes under this particular. This particular welcome will be followed that, uh, or there will be a scope of it. OK, whatever is written inside this welcome that is going to be under the scope of this particular function. That's what is happening. over here. So if I simply go ahead and print. Something like this. OK, and let's say print. Hello. OK, so now basically what happened? Here under welcome function, I have created two print statements. 
okay these are not two individual if i want to create one more print statement and this should be outside of my scope then i have to break that indentation so what will happen python automatically understood that okay for this welcome function we have these two lines and this print line is different one so that is the reason when i simply call my function over here okay when i call this function see what happens okay first i'll load these two and then i'll call my function like this so it is showing print it is printing hello and world individual if i take all these three and then run it so what will happen function will be called these two will be executed and then finally this line will be executed over here. if i give a space or if i intend this parallel to the above lines and then rerun the code this time it is going to print all the three because now python is thinking that this haha is also the part of this welcome function over here so you need to define these functions very properly okay the data that you are writing inside this function has to be written very properly okay now simply you can uh, you can add multiple numbers you can send different numbers and basically print the data that you want over here like this in the same way you can create your own calculator and then work accordingly maybe you have a function that follows or that uh, that requires some name okay so something like if i run this code and then i pre, uh, then i pass greet john so it says hello john but what if the user forgot then what so then it in that case ideally it should have thrown error because this time you have not passed anything but what i have done here i have simply declared that okay there is going to be a default name if there are no names passed as parameter in python function so it is all about how well you can use these functions and then simply play around with them now you can take all these functions all together and then you can create your own module over here okay you can create your own module over here now how basically it works out check i have created something called as my module okay now in this my module what i have done in this my module basically what i have done i have created three different uh, statements two function and one variable over here okay now two functions basically one of the function is uh, just stating hello and whatever name has been passed the other one is basically adding the number over here third one is the default value of pi okay now these are the three different uh, codes and which i want to use them in my program maybe i have written this uh, some time ago and i don't want to reuse them instead what i want i want to use the existing code itself so what i will do in my function in my code i will basically import that module over here you can see step number 1 create the module so module created under the file name is my module dot py py is the extension for my powershell uh, sorry python script and here system this so here what i'm doing i'm basically using this keyword called import this is how importing of any package or any module happens inside your python whether you want to call your built in modules or the module which you have customized you have created in a custom way in both ways you can simply use the keyword called import and then the module name this is going to be quite helpful for us in future okay in upcoming modules so this is how basically it works out and now see what i have done 
I've taken the module name. And here I'm using simply greet. Now from where this greet came, greet came from. From this module over here means this file. My module has a function called greet and it requires a name. So it will print hello in that particular name. What I am doing in my code, I've imported my data. I've imported my data. Or my module over here, my module dot that function name dot the name that you want to print. OK, so when I simply use this, it is gonna it should execute what exactly I'm looking for. Then in the same way. We have result equals my module plus add number. So from where this module dot add number is coming into the picture, it is coming from this module over here. In the same way, I can simply print that and then module path. So I can call this particular module and then whatever is inside that module, I can simply module name dot that function name and then if any argument is getting passed over here. Simply that's how basically it works out. OK, now here my VS code editor is having some issue. So when I run this code, it, it is giving this particular error. OK, just let me. Check. OK, and now if I run this. Here it is giving the error. Okay, it's not resolving what I. Okay, this is the issue basically with my VS Code. No problem. That is the reason I have another module added over here or another ideally uh, IDE which I can simply use. I'll go for. Open, I'll pass this. And here I have my modules. You can see here now my code is available. So when I simply run this entire run module, let me run it parallelly. So when I run this module, see, it says hello sing. Why sing? Because I have simply added sing over here. Then it prints 47, which should be 15 plus 32. Okay. And then it is value of Pi 3.14159. If I change the value to something like PBs, and then if I run the code, even you can see this time it says hello PBS and then the old numbers over here. So basically, I have uh, my own module available, and basically, I'm using those modules to perform my job. This is the usage of. Modules which is basically. You can use in order to work with. Anything and everything that you are looking for. OK, this is the easiest method how you can create your own modules and then call them and then simply work with them accordingly. OK. Now if I let's jump on to the next. OK, before we move on to anything else. Uh, do you guys have any questions? OK, I'm already getting some questions over here. How do my module PY identifies my module? OK, the question is very good. Guys, look here. It's a very good question. Here I have two files, five modules PY file. OK, let me magnify if it is not clearly visible. I hope now it should be. OK, so here I have two files. OK. Five modules. Dot PY. And my module dot PY. My module dot PY is basically the 
module which I have to import, which is already having the predefined functions in it. And here I am going to use the keyword called import so and so. So wherever you use this particular keyword called import, what this import does is it the very first time it checks in the default location where exactly you are available. Like if you look at the folder location, here you can see module one basics. So the import will check under basics. Do I have a file name called my module dot py? If I change this particular file, OK, let's go back over here and let's change the file name to. My module. Uh, let's say no. OK, in simple short, it could be any other name. OK, now when I try to run this particular code, what will happen? It will give me an error. See what error it shows. Module not found error. No module named my module. No. OK, it checked in the default location because you have only if you have only given this particular name, so it checked in the current directory and in the current directory, there is no file name called my module. No, so basically it gave an error over here. If I rectify either I rename my file or if I rectify, rectify my uh, code, basically it will work again exactly in the same manner, same order. OK, so this is how basically you can work with your programs you can call them accordingly and then simply work with them the same approach is basically used every time what it will do import what what is what it is going to perform it will check the current location do i have it or not but this is for the custom module what about the modules which i have installed like if i go for any other module like data visualization so here i have installed a library from internet called mat Plot lib. This module I have not created. I have simply called it in my machine and then I am simply importing that. But now, if you look at the location over here in this folder, there is no file called matplotlib over here. How again it is working? First thing, what import did it verified in the current location? Do I have this or not? If it is not there, then it checks in the current path. You all have path in your Windows machine, in your Linux machines, right? We have some default path, system paths. It will check do I have a particular directory that contains this file or not? So, yes, there is a path for my Python uh, executor, my Python files, which is created when you have installed your Python program. At that particular time only, the library, the entire library got added into that particular system path. So that is the reason I'm not I will not get error over here. But for my custom modules, I am getting the error in this particular case. OK, this is how basically your system identifies where the module is available. First time it will check in the current directory, then it will check in the system path whether it is there or not. If it is not available, then only it will start throwing an error. So in so module error not found. OK, this is all about module one. The basics of how the PowerShell data, uh, sorry, how the Python data types, how the control flow functions and modules in your Python program works. Out. OK, now moving towards the next module. OK, that is the data manipulation with Python. Now this module is quite important in terms of so many things. OK, because basically when you talk about uh, uh, data manipulation, we'll be talking about multiple things. We have list, we have tuples, we have dictionaries, we have list comprehensions, we have strings, we have files to handle. We have libraries to basically manage the data. What all things are basically happening by the way? This numpy, what uh, what is written over here, is numerical Python in short, okay, which is basically for a numerical computing library, okay, which ba basically manages your arrays and mathematical functions in Python. 
OK, so you don't have to uh, create a customized array and then work with that. No, no, nothing required like that. Simply use the NumPy and start working on it. Then we have pandas. OK, this is also uh, one of the famous library, which is basically uh, used for uh, data analysis or you can say particularly for the structured data. Whenever you want to manage your structured data, then in that case we go for pandas. So we'll come to each and everything one by one. Now when you talk about list in Python, list is nothing but an element which can store multiple things inside it. OK, now if you compare it with variables, variable is something which can store only one value at a time. Either integer or number or uh, floating number or string or whatever it is. One thing at a time when you rewrite the same uh, rewrite another value. Uh, on that particular variable, the variable also changes. But what if I have to add multiple data to a particular? Uh, particular list, a particular element. OK, assume a simple example. I want to create a variable in terms of variable. Try to understand. OK, I want to create a variable and variable name. I want to give like uh, weekdays. The so first I've given Monday. Then printed the data. It prints Monday, no problem. Then what I did, I wanted the next day. Weekday equals to Tuesday now. And now I print the data, the value will again change. But what if I want to store Monday, Tuesday till Friday, Saturday, Sunday in the single element itself? For that, we need the list. List is basically which will allow you to create the data, access the data, modify it, check the length. So all these operations that can be performed on a particular list are mentioned over here. OK, basically when you talk about lists in Python, it is the most important element because it will allow you to store multiple. Uh, values which is going to be very handy, which is going to be very helpful in future. OK, now how it is going to be used? We will be seeing that soon in the practicals. Next is tuple. OK, tuples are basically immutable. That means simply it cannot be modified once created. OK, so basically when you talk about tuples, you can have multiple operations on it, like you can create it, you can access it, you can unpack, you can check the length, you can uh, do multiple things, but nowhere you can simply edit the tuples. You have dictionaries, again, key pair values, you have uh, strings available, you have file handling operations, all these things. Basically, file handling is something like you have a particular file. Now, till now, whatever we are doing, we are performing anything and everything on the script itself. Means in the script only, we are storing the data. In script only, we are, uh, means in the terminal itself, we are printing the data. But what if I need to fetch the information from a particular file? process it and then print the output. For that file handling is going to be very helpful for every programming language. There it is having its own mechanism for file handling in Python. It is much simpler. You have to just remember these things. So if you want to read the file only, then in that case you have to use the R alphabet where you have to use it. We'll come back to that. You want to write something. Then you go for W. You want to append something. OK, append is also writing the data, but also preserving the pre uh, previous content. OK, then we have exclusive creating uh, creation mode. We have binary mode, then we have the text mode. Different modes are available depending upon what your requirement is. And basically then based on that you perform the operation. Simple example like your manager gave you a file that uh, OK, Jitu read the, like for example, there are five columns in it and he to, he tells me Jitu do one thing read column one and column five, but don't change anything in that. Just read it and then work on. It. 
So that then, then in that case, what will be my requirement? Obviously, I have to go for the read mode. I don't want to disturb or destroy that particular file. In that case, I'll go for the R option over here. If no one has given me uh, any specific permission or I can do whatever I want, then in that case, I can go for W, I can go for A, I can go for uh, R, anything. Read, write, append, whatever I want, I can simply work with them. Then there are multiple libraries that you can use in order to basically uh, work under Python. Okay. Some of them are by default available in your machine. Some of them are not available in your machine that you have to install manually and then simply work with that. Let's take a simple example of this numpy. Okay. So here is my command prompt available. Hold on. Here is my command prompt. Simply I've opened this command prompt as administrator in the default location. Location could be anything, no problem with that. Here, what I want is I want to install the NumPy library. It is already there, I think, but still I'll install it. Okay. If it is incorrect, it will throw an error. If it is correct and it, if it is already installed, then it will give me the message already installed. Okay. So to install any Python package on your machine, you can go for the pip install. And then that particular. Module name. Obviously, when you start working on Python, you have to research, do some research, then OK, which module will be good for which particular topic? OK, so maybe I want to install NumPy. In that case, I'll simply write numpy over here and then simply hit enter. When I do that, it takes some time and you can see here it says requirement already satisfied. Meaning numpy and so and so it is already available. Then it, it does not need to install anything. Possibly I think in this machine. Uh, let's say scipy this particular name. This is not installed on my machine, I think. OK, so let's check. OK, see, even that is available over here. OK, so Django is available, not available. That is for sure. See here. It is not showing this time requirement already satisfied, blah, blah, blah. It is showing collecting Django, collecting artifacts and other things, SQL powers and now it was checking for DZ data. It was already there. So now it is installing the collected these three packages. OK, so if you install one single package and other packages are also interdependent or depends on other packages, then. In that case, Python will take care of it. Python will take care of that particular scenario. This is the beauty of Python. You just need to know ABC of what you are doing. Remaining D to Z will be taken care by Python. But that ABC is important. OK, that's what I wanted to show you over here. OK, so. Now NumPy. So this is a numerical uh, Python library which is commonly used for the arrays. OK, so like if you want to use arrays in your environment and then basically you need to work with that, then in that case, if you do not have NumPy, you will not be able to work with it. You need to install it. Installation method I've already told you, and then you can simply play around with that. What is the advantage of doing that? So basically, NumPy stores multiple values at the same time, like what list is doing, but NumPy is much faster than list. Overall, if you check the overall picture of it, NumPy and list are doing the same thing. Both are saving multiple values over here, but NumPy basically is much faster than the Python's list, which is by default available for us. OK, and when you have 
a very huge code when you have multiple things to execute in your environment, when you have multiple uh, calculations to perform, then in that case you need much faster response. That is the reason people use NumPy rather than just going with the default list. OK. Now, when you talk about NumPy operations, you can install it, you can import it, you can check the NumPy arrays and other stuff that you can perform with the help of NumPy. Pandas, basically it is an open source library. Whoever is from Linux background, they must be exactly knowing what open source is. OK, so Pandas is basically an open source uh, library which anyone and everyone can use it depending upon what your requirement is. OK, it is much faster when you talk in terms of the execution. It can perform anything and everything that you are basically looking for. OK, now what else can be done with it or what are the basic features of your Python Pandas? So basically we have data frame, we have series, we have import export, we have clearing and all these things will basically help you out in performing the operations related to pandas in Python. OK. Now I have taken only two libraries. Because of the time constraint. Here I've taken multiple names. You can go through all of them. You can take care of. You can take help of each and every module depending upon what your requirement is and then basically you work with that. Like for example, here I have taken a single name called uh, Beautiful Soap. Now here I'm not talking about any bathing soap or something. Beautiful Soap is a library which basically helps you in performing web scraping. You want to uh, create user interface, GUI you want to create. You, have, you want to create the applications. Pillow in that particular uh, manner will be helpful for you. You want to perform some sort of uh, AI ML related tasks. Then in that case, uh, Kiras, SciPy, uh, Scikit-learn, TensorFlow. This is going to be helpful for you. So depending upon what your requirement is, you need to install that particular library and then play around with it. Let's see how the practical implementation goes with this particular module. OK, so it is almost four o'clock. Uh, guys, uh, should we take a break for five minutes? If you guys suggest drop a yes. OK. People are writing only one has written yes. What about others? If you want, I can I can continue with that. I have no problem with that. <laughs> then I say much needed. OK. Cool, guys, I, I understood that fine. So let's have a small break for five minutes and we'll be back at uh, 4 or 5 and then we'll resume the session. OK. This recording will be available and it will be shared with everyone, so don't worry about that. But that doesn't mean that you have to leave the entire session and then don't join it, okay? Please. There are so many things that I'm going to take in these next four modules, so please stay tuned. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can drop it in the chat window based on the timings. I will definitely uh, reply to all the questions.
Okay, guys, thank you for your response. I can see so many people are back, so good. Let's continue. So before break, we were talking about list, tuples, strings, libraries, and specific libraries. We are talking. We were talking about NumPy and Panda. So let's see how practically this can help you out and how you can take additional uh, advantages of these things. Now, as I told you earlier, like how you can install or how you can simply use one single value with a variable in the same way we are using five different values with one single element over here. With one single element. This element is basically the list. OK, now here also we have one empty list. Sometimes in program. Uh, Sometimes in your uh, program, you might have to initialize a list and that will have more data added later on. Then in that case, sometimes what we do, we create an empty list and then simply we play with that. Right? So in the same way, I, I can create multiple co uh, elements over here, multiple values to my list over here, or I can create a simple empty list also. So let's run this entire list over here and if you take this particular component how you can access it so these lists are basically stored in the sequential format in an array which always starts from one so if i simply execute this line number six over here that says print my list and in the square bracket zero that means i'm gonna target the first element zero means the first element in my list. So here the only output I'll be getting is one. As you can see over. Here. Then here we have print my list two two four. Now here two is basically the index number. Zero is uh, for one index number is zero. This is index number one. This is index number two. This is index number three and index number four. So basically what I'm targeting over here is from index two to index four. When I print this, you can see here I'm getting index this minus one. As per this line, it should print from index number two. That means from three till index number four, that is five, but it is printing only three and four. Because whatever number you have written over here, it starts from there and whatever number you have written over here, it will be always minus one. So if I write here, for example, if I write here three. And if I print only this entire value, see it is only printing one single because it is starting at three and ending at three only. So whatever number you have written on the right side of this colon, it will be always that index value minus one. OK, and then finally in the program itself, we have minus value. So negative value inside this list basically prints data from right to left. Five, four, three, two, one like that. So when I execute this line, it is going to print only five over. In the same way you can assign now see here modifying the content on zeroth place we know it is one okay we can again check it one more time you can see here on the zeroth place we have number one but what is happening over here now we are assigning the value as 10. So when i run it and then i reprint the data this time it is 10. So whatever value was stored earlier, now it got replaced with the new value. By looking at this line, you can simply understand, OK, if you want to append something, then in that case, append means existing data plus what you have added over here. So in my list, if I print the data now, you can see. Oh, sorry, the content is not available, so I'll write it down. Like this. 
you can see here instead of 1 to 10 i uh, 1 to 5 i have 10 to 3 4 5 now what i'll do i will append 6 over here and then verify again okay whether it is actually appending the content or not this time what happened you can see here earlier it was only till 5 but now we have got 6 over here so basically this is how list will help you out you can add anything in your list just assume this as your shopping list okay you all do shopping right you go to grocery shop or you go to flipkart or anything you have a list over there then in that way what you do basically you add some content into your into your list or you remove some content from the list it is exactly the same thing what is happening over here even you can delete it also okay you can print it you can check the length of it like uh, maybe I'm not sure how, how many elements I have added in my list over here. Let's check what is the element. Okay, six elements are available. Jitu, what is the proof? There are six elements only. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So basically, it is giving you each and everything how exactly you can work with your element, work with your list. In the same way, we have tuples available over here. OK, so you create tuples. Now see here, if you look at this list closely, my list starts from square bracket, then the value and then square bracket close. If I jump on to tuple, tuple starts from a regular bracket. Nowhere I have mentioned that it is going to be list or it is going to be tuple or whatsoever it is. So here, let me show you what exactly I'm trying to explain. Now, if I go ahead and print the content actually the type of it okay if i run this entire line see here it clearly says this is a list nowhere i have mentioned that it is going to be a list but here if i come back and and then if i try to print the type of my tuple okay then what it says see it clearly says it is a tuple so you explicitly how exactly it is working it is all happening due to this curly bracket if just imagine if i change it to this even though the name is my tuple and if i try to find it out see now you can see here it is a list just because the brackets are changed. So these are the small basic things that you have to understand that you have to remember when you talk about the types of your uh, defined data, okay? Which bracket you are using, if it is a regular bracket, tuple, then if it is a square bracket, it is going to be a list. Now basically where exactly this list will help you out? or this tuple will help you out, or this dictionary. Now see here, if I check this dictionary, I have two key value pair, key one, key, uh, value one, key two, value two. If I simply run this thing over here, you can see I have the data available like this. You want to print only the key one and want to find out what is the value of it, check this out. You want to assign the value, you want to uh, basically perform any type of operation can be done with the help of this dictionary. In the same way, when you talk about the strings, you have two string here like welcome from BBS. Then what I'm doing over here is string plus string. And when I run it, it gives me again one more string. But this time the data, this line number four is basically concatenating my data. It is adding two strings to perform one job. And then I can perform all my operations that I want on this particular string. Okay. Now, these things where exactly it is going to be helpful in the sixth and seventh uh, file, you will get to know that files. If you check this here, I want to open a file by these three lines. You can see you can understand that. OK, so here under module two, 
there is a file called demo.txt. This is the file. And here you can see there are some content available over here. Okay. There is some data available over here. Hello world new content. Okay. Now what I will do over here in this case. I'll try to open this file in the read only mode. In the read mode. So what I'll do over here, I'll execute this code. Now see here. If you remember in the presentation, we saw R, W, A, B, T, X. So many alphabets were there. This is the place where you have to use them. Open is the function that you are using, then the path of the file, comma, the mode of the file. You're telling also that with which mode you need to basically open that particular file. So here what I will do basically. Here what I'm doing, I'm going to open the file, but in the read only mode so that the content should not be destroyed no matter what happens. Now if I run this entire data, uh, this entire line over here, let's see what we get when we execute this. When you run this. You can see here. It is printing the data. That is hello world and new content and basically it closes the file. See, it is a very simple concept. You also read the physical books, right? Your notebooks, your copies or whatsoever. You open it to read that and then you close it. That is the basic format. So when you are opening the file, when you are reading the content, when you are printing the content, then you have to close the file also. That's why this file close is important over here. What it is doing basically it is adding the content or oh sorry it is just printing the content on my screen. Now I want to write some content over here. So I'll say hello. Everyone. From PBS. As of now, if you look at this text file, see there are only two lines, right? There are only two lines. Let me go back and then run this code and it says 24 something it sh it shows over here and then it closes the file but really i'm not sure what actually happened either you go manually to that particular file but see what happened now why this happened because you have used the w option over here which basically overwrites the existing content Okay. Manually you can check that or you run the same old program and then basically you can see here. It is printing the same content over here, the new content, the updated content. In the same way, if I go for a append. Okay, and here I'll simply write this is new line. From G2. Okay, and now I'll simply execute this code. This time it says 28. Now if I read the same content again, check. OK, the problem is there is no. End line over here, so what it did, it created one single line. OK, I can format that and practically also I can programmatically uh, programmatically also I can modify it. But my line is available. That is important. Thing. OK, so here what I can do. For appending the data. I will add slash n over here. Slash n basically for new line. Okay, so I'll write here. This is another, I think, third line. And let's remove from G2 from here. Let's run it and let's read it again and check this out. Two files I modified manually, uh, two lines I modified manually. Third line automatically got appended over here due to this slash n. So, from a particular file, you are able to read it, you are able to overwrite the file, you are able to append the data into the file also. That is the beauty of using the files with Python modules. Now, not only this one, check this out. I want to verify if the particular file exists or not. 
maybe you have to run a program where you need to find out uh, whether the particular file is present or not. If it is not there, create it or, up, or up, uh, update the user, whatsoever it is. Okay, but here what I'm doing, I'm calling the OS module, which is already part of my Windows machine. How it got installed? It got installed when I was installing Python on this particular system. At that time, it got installed automatically. Okay, all those libraries and everything. So this is the actual class which I'm going to use. And when I run this code over here, it says file exist. If you look at the location, demo.txt is present. But I know that demo one is not there. It's not there. So then when you run it, now you can see no such file exists. So basically your program, your Python program is able to identify whether the particular file is available or not. This is happening because of the Python libraries easily. Okay, this is how basically the Python files and libraries works out. Where you have multiple libraries available, like for example. So we were talking about matplotlib, so we have already installed it. So the basic simple funda is if you want to import anything, import and then the file name that will do the job or sorry, the library name that will do the job. In the same way, we have a math class available over here and you are you, you, you can see here there is a function called dot sqrt. You must have guessed it as of now. It is the square root. What is the square root of 25? We all know it is 5. Right? What is the square root of 9? Let's say when you run it, you have the answer. The value is getting changed over here. You want to see what is 3 to the power 2. Then in that case, you can simply oh sorry. This is the 3 to the power 2 is 9 and this is the pi value. I executed both of them all together. So these basic mathematical calculations also can be done with the default libraries which are available. These libraries are just playing like plug and play stuff. You plug it when you when you need it. You import them. Plugging means import it, use it. When you don't need it, remove it. Problem solved. That is how basically it works. When you talk about the NumPy, now let me show you. The actual usage of what actually NumPy can do. So here I have already installed. Now see, this is the beauty of comment. Okay, because I have already installed it, so I'm just commenting it out when you guys do it. So you remove the hashtag and then work with that. Simple problem solved. Okay, so now it is already installed. So what I'm doing, I'm importing the NumPy, but the name looks quite big. OK, so what I'm doing over here, I'm calling this as NP. This could be anything. Like if you remember, I, I introduced myself. My name is Jitendra Singh Tomer in short G2. So that G2 is the alias in the same way. Here also we are creating the alias for our library. This is a very common practice between the uh, Python developers because the library name could be quite big. Sometime you can't call that particular name every time. That is the reason we simply rename it and then we simply call it. OK, it's not mandatory to import uh, to import the alias also, but that reduces my job. OK, so I'm importing this and now. Let me reduce the font size so that. It should be visible now. OK, so you can see here I've created a single array with this particular numpy. You can see here np dot array I have created and I've passed four values over here and then I'm simply printing the data over here. OK, this could be done with the help of list, but we wanted to use the class or we wanted to use the libraries over here. So I am simply doing that. You want to print something, you can simply take the help of it and then like subtract one. Do whatever you want square like squaring each and every element. OK, and finally, when you print the data. You have what you want. See. 
this is the current list or current array then what we did we added two to each and every array over here so one plus two three that's three two plus three uh, two plus two four three plus two five and so on then we subtracted one there's the value this is subtra this subtraction is happening from the original value okay because here we are just printing the content we are not storing it somewhere okay and here we are just querying the entire value present in the list just imagine in your own way if you want to write a program as multiple values maybe 5 10 values and you want the square of each and every value how you are going to do it in your own language that you know because everyone said yes in the morning when i asked do you know some sort of programming language or not how you are going to do it just imagine about that so these type of things becomes very easy when you talk in terms of python now imagine this kind of array it is a multi dimensional array okay you have different rows you have different columns to perform a job when you go for data data science you when you go for ai ml this is what you are going to need very badly this is the basic content that you have to know how to store the content how to basically use them so you can use these kind of formats you can create the array like this you want to print the array you can simply do that oh sorry this is you can see here all the data is getting printed here without having any problem you want to specifically target an individual row then like this or in this particular manner like this so basically there are multiple ways to deal with the data that you have collected in your rows and columns and then you simply play around with them then we have pandas so basically pandas will help you out in uh, performing all the major task uh, related to your what do you say uh, data manipulation in simple terms okay when you talk about uh, data there are two things that you have to remember about the pandas in pandas there are two things one is your data frame which is basically a two dimensional labeled data structure and then you have series which is only one dim one dimensional labeled array okay so when you want the 2d data to work with then in that case you need this data frame and when you have only one dimensional array to work with then in that case you can work with the series data uh, series pandas over here you can see here i have basically stored my name in array format over here and then let's first import the modules then only it will be helpful you can see here both the modules are loaded and now when i simply access them you can see here this is your d type is object that is the serial one and when i run it you can see here it is printing the data the zeroth number is G, uh, j i the first number is e and so on basically it is printing your entire data in this entire one directional one dimensional format so when you have to deal with 1d format 1d data then in that case you can use the series inside panda and when you have multiple things to follow up when you have multi dimensional array to follow up then in that case you can simply let me see when you have multi dimensional means when you have when you should have rows and columns in your structure then in that case you have to go for this kind of data over here okay not only this much we, we can also read the content from a csv file you can see here there is a file called pandas.csv if i open this file just to show you what is the content of it
see here. That's the content of my file. OK, so possibly your management can give you uh, some data in the form of rows and columns generally in the CSV format. And if you want to play around with that particular information, this is what we can do. Let me first clear the screen so that it will be understood what exactly we are doing. Check. And if you want to ensure that, yes, this is what actually coming from the data over here, then what I will do, I'll change some contents over here like 9, 10, 11, 12. OK, you can see a previous data is 1, 2, 3, 4 in this column 1. And now I have changed it. And now when I run this entire data, there we have it. So live data, it is fetching from the file. And then now you can use it, use it in your uh, serial 1D format or in the data frame 2D format in whatever way you want. And then you can simply play around with it. This is the beauty of Pandas, the additional open source library which saves data or which performs any type of operation either in 1D, one dimensional structure or two dimensional structure. Okay. Now, moving towards the next part, that is the object oriented programming that is oops. OK, now this is a concept which basically. Is quite important when you talk about any. Language where you want. You have to write less code efficiently. In in, in short term, this is what I can explain. OK, so when you talk about object oriented programming, basically this is a new way where you can basically declare objects, you can create classes and then simply work on that. There are multiple methods. There are multiple concepts associated with object oriented programming like classes and object like encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism and abstraction. First, if you talk about classes and object, can anyone tell me what exactly these things are? What do you mean by classes and object in Python or in any of the language? Just one liner. OK, to make it simple, let me explain in this way. So imagine you want to create a program for cars. OK, cars. Audi, BMW, all those type of cars. OK, now here what I want is. Basically. You create a blueprint. Like this. Uh, blueprint or you can say a template. OK, like it will have four doors, it will have four tires, it will have an engine. OK, all those things you can add it into one single template blueprint. That blueprint itself will be called as a class. And when you use that particular template or blueprint to make an actual specific car out of it. Then that becomes an object. OK, so basically. It is very simple to understand that when you talk about the object, it is the instance of a particular class. It is a small instance. OK, you created a very big template. The template will have everything, anything and everything. Then from that particular template, you are actually creating some sort of. Or you are actually implementing some sort of uh, product out of it. That specific product is basically an object of that blueprint. That blueprint is nothing but the class. OK. Sandeep has written a very good example over here. Example class is fruit and mango. Object of. OK. Full. Acceptable uh, definition. 
Yeah, you got the point over there. Okay, now how or where exactly it is going to be useful for us? So if I look at the program, if I look at the program, guys, look here. So when you talk about a class, so here what I have done, I created a bike. Okay, a bike class. That bike will have some sort of name for it. It will definitely have some gears or it is going to be a moped. It will be having some engine. It will be having some CC, right? This is the basic blueprint that I want for a particular class. Now for this particular class, I'm going to create an object. This my bike is basically an object over here. Now class is one only, but what I am doing this time, in reality, I'm going to make two different uh, objects over here. One is going to be Royal, Royal Enfield and the other one is going to be Keyway Banda. There's a very good bike which I have seen nowadays getting viral on YouTube. I don't know for what reason, but it is quite good. Let's take that example only. So when I take the first example over here, I don't have to create individual uh, variables for each and everything. No, simply what I have done, I created the class over here. I created an object for that particular class, and now I'm referring to those particular objects. OK, one of the object is my bike dot name. Name is going to be Royal Enfield. Fine, no problem. It is going to have five gears. The engine is going to be twin cylinder. CC is 350 CC. So what I'm doing, I have declared multiple objects over here and then I'm just assigning the values in single shot. And now when I simply want to see the data over here. You can see. Bike is. OK. Let's clear the. Terminal, let's run them one by one. Bike is Royal Enfield. Then. Gears is this engine is this and CC is this. So basically what is happening? I have declared all the variables, all the values over here. And all those are basically assigned to one single class and basically it is how uh, this is how it is working. Now I don't have to create again another class to basically deal with that. No, not required. I can just reassign new values over here. And simply if I run this entire. Now the bike name got changed. When I check the gears, if I check the engine, if I check the CC, everything is now changed. So I created one single class for that particular class. I created one single object and for that object I have assigned multiple values. Those objects I have assigned multiple values. It is basically working in what whatever exact way it should be working. OK, I'm getting the exact answer what exactly I was expecting over here. So this object oriented programming is basically quite important when you talk in terms of uh, creating your own classes and members and other things. So this is really very helpful when you have a huge uh, code and you need to use the multiple lines, uh, the multiple, the same code multiple times. OK, you don't want to define them again and again. You don't want to declare them again and again. Just assign the values and then simply work with that. If new requirement is there, then create one more instance of that particular. Uh, class and then simply work with that also. Like right now this instance, uh, this particular object contains only four values over here. Maybe someone says, OK, G2, I don't want only four. I want 10 values over here, but I want to save this also. So why should I redefine everything from scratch again? OK, so I need to do some basic. Manipulation over here and I'm good to go with anything else. OK, so basically this is how the entire. Uh, object oriented concept works out over here. 
when you talk about encapsulation basically encapsulation is one uh, one funda single fundamental principle which basically refers to bundling of data in its method okay the data and the methods different methods how what methods you are using over here all of them will be bundled all together and then simply you work with them basically when you talk about the encapsulation there are three things that you have or three uh, or you can in, in in easier terms encapsulation can be basically achieved through three different access uh, methods or members one is your public method other one is your protected method the other one is the private method okay so when you talk about encapsulation now how how you are going to declare them it is very interesting over here so when you declare these public protected and private uh, attributes over here have a look here let me magnify check this out so when there is self dot what is that self ignore it for now but when it is only a single dot notation that means you are talking about the public attribute or public member when you have dot and a single underscore then you are talking about a protected member and when you have dot and then double score double score over here double underscore sorry then you are talking about the private member means this is how you create it in different technologies and different programming methods the method of creating or achieving this encapsulation is a complete different procedure simply if you want to create public protected or private member you have to follow this particular approach over here and then based on that you can simply work with whatever way you want when i simply run this code over here you can simply see it is printing the data exactly in the format which i have written over here okay first the public attribute the public method is getting executed then the protected one then the private one. okay and then later on it is just printing the data over here so basically the overall encapsulation is all about bundling the multiple data non, no need to provide any everything outside the class or what is the basic level of scope that you want to provide and then basically basically uh, based on that you provide the access or the readability to that particular code now next is abstraction so basically this is also another uh, important concept when you talk in terms of uh, uh, object oriented programming so basically when you look at the code over here see here i have written the entire code in proper format so that you can easily understand okay this is the if you look at this code over here this is where i am defining that okay i'm going to use the abstract method over here this is one class that basically performs the calculation for the rectangle this is the class for the circle here i am basically creating a method and then passing the data over here and then finding the area and the parameter over so when you run this entire code you will get to know what exactly check this out the value i've passed over here is 3 based on that it found out the area and the parameter and all those things how it actually it is internally working over here it is all working on what you have basically passed over here and how your area and the parameter is getting executed now here if you look at this code over here i have written uh, i have typed here written keyword written is basically gonna return what is gonna be the output of this entire statement okay so length into width basically if you if you are looking at this self over here this is a predefined uh, actually it could be any name that you want okay so for function calling when you are uh, when, when you are basically calling a particular function it requires some sort of reference to be called 
okay without this keyword it is gonna fail it's not gonna work out so you have to pass a keyword over this keyword could be anything and self is the keyword which is getting used from a very long time so it is still used till date okay and in future also it will be in use only but this is how basically you'll be able to declare what what actually you have uh, executed over here okay now don't want to jump into the depths of now let's talk about web scraping. This is quite interesting thing. Now web scraping is something which I told you earlier that you have you can uh, execute or you can call or you can retrieve any data from any website on internet. But obviously they those particular websites should allow the uh, web scraping. Not every website will actually allow you. I'm telling very frankly. Not all the websites allow the web scraping. So basically here I am calling two different uh, or I'm importing two different uh, values over here, request and beautiful soap. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically first I'll show you what is there inside this URL. OK, so I'll open my web browser. And I'll go to this particular. Now assume that you got some sort of requirement and uh, you need to now this particular web page is a Wikipedia page that lists all the dog breeds available. I don't want to get into that trap whether they, they are still alive. These many species are alive or not. That's not my concern, but assume that my manager told me G to do one thing. I want to fetch all these names over here. Okay, using your Python techniques, how exactly you are going to do that? Now this particular URL is available with me. All the names are available here. Some people will think, OK, G2, let's go for just select that copy, paste, paste it in the notepad and then modify all of them one by one. Why should I do all those things? When I go for the Python program over here, this Python program will actually do the entire job for me. What I have to only do, I have to just pass the URL over here and perform what actually I want in this particular data. OK, so let me execute the code one by one. So first I'll import the libraries, then I'll. Set the URL. That this is going to be the URL, then I'm going to basically create a beautiful soap object. Just now we have we, we spoke about object in classes, so I'm creating an object soup for beautiful soap over here. OK, and passing the requirement that it is going to be it is going to be an HTML parser. But simply it is going to be a web page. OK, no error. Fine. Then I am passing that what actually I want now for this particular approach. You need to go to that particular site and then find out what actually you want. So I want a table in the table. If you want to understand this simply, let me show you what I have done. I'll select this name AC. Right click. Inspect element or inspect. And check here there should be a common class. Let's say. OK, let me take this particular class as of now. MW content hyper container. The MW container content class I selected over there, or I can go for any specific class. Something like this one div call. Check this out. div hyphen call. Let me magnify it. Div class equals div call. This is the class name that actually I want to call over here. That I want to target actually. That's what I have set over here. If I want, I want I, I can print the table. But it won't be of any use over here. Check this out. It is having, but it is showing me the entire list. Here is the name Chinese crested dog. I don't know what kind of breed it is, but there is a name available. If you want to verify, you can copy that name. You can go back and see Chinese crested dog. That means we are going in the correct direction. But if you want to actually 
fetch only the titles of that particular, then see here. Now I'm using a list, empty list I've created. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to paste or I'm going to append, check this out, all the breed names into this particular list. Okay, sorry. And now I'm going to print that. So check this out. You can parallelly. Okay. You can check this. Take any name A to C, take any name and that particular name is available over here. This is how web scraping works out. You need to do some R&D on the page where, from where you need to find out the content. It is some time consuming part. Even I took some time to fetch out all this information. But one, once you understand the logic behind it, then it becomes very easy. Right in the same way, if I take another example. OK, uh, I'll take OK. This is another example. Unsplash, uh, I told you the website. Let me show you what it has actually. OK, so assume that all these flowers which are available over here, you can take any website, you can take any name, but again, you need to do some homework over there. So all these images you can see here, they are not going to get downloaded in HD image. For that, the code is different. I need to do some more R&D on that. But these images which are available over here, I need to download them. Assume that I want to paste it in some of my website with this particular size only. I want to work with that. So what I'm going to do now for that, I'll go to my module four and you can see there is a folder here called flower images and which is empty as of now. So now when I run this entire program, what this site will, what this program will do, it will go to that particular unsplash and it will download all the content one by one for me. Now, one thing I'm telling you here, frankly, sometimes data would be some of some usefulness. Otherwise, sometimes it downloads some uh, irrelevant data also. OK, so I've checked this. It's downloading each and every content. I'll go back and here we go. As you can see. 52 items, 57 items, 58 items and so on. So basically it downloaded all those images on my system. The path for which I have given over here on top. OK, this is how basically it works. Out. This is the importance of web scraping. OK, you can fetch, you can filter any site and then you can simply play around with it. OK, it could be any data I have taken here images. It could be videos. It could be any data which is parsable, which is simply. Uh, where you can simply perform this web scraping. Most of the websites does not allow like Google images does not allow web scraping. First, I tried with that only then I came up with this unsplash, which is completely free of cost. You can download anything and everything from unsplash images. So simply I thought, OK, let me take this particular opportunity to download all the images and now all the images are under one single folder. I'm not denying that code cannot be modified. Even there are codes available. I can do that, but it needs some time where it will download the maximum uh, size. Available. But for that you need to perform again. More number of steps to basically do uh, to perform that. But it is doable. OK. Next is. How this. Visualization works out. Visualization is all about how you can visualize your data, how you can present it in whatever way you want. It could be your chart format. It could be your simple plots. It could be scatter format, anything that you want. OK, so like for example, let me import the. Library over here, this matplotlib is required without that. It's not going to work out. So assume that I have two set or two sets of data available in form of list. And I need to plot some diagram for it. OK, so what I am going to do. When I simply. 
execute this last line, check what happens. It shows a simple plot over here. Simple line plot. Basically what it is doing, what data I have given here on top for X axis and Y axis, it has basically declared that and now based on that it has created the image. In the same way, for visualization, there are again n number of things that can be done. Like if I take this entire code and execute it, see. It is your simple scatter plot. This data, whatever data is available over here, it is getting called from the file that is file.csv. If I go to this location, file.csv, Yeah, there it is. File.csv. There it is. So basically, what I have done, one more interesting thing. I needed code for this scattered data over here. So what I did, I took some code from online and remaining data I have generated using the Python. Like this units and totals and cost. This all dynamic data has been generated over here. So all this data has been passed to this particular scatter plot and which is basically showing me the content over here. This is all about like there are some uh, items available. What is the cost of it and overall cost of it? So this is what it is showing over here. I have one more example, a simpler example. Which I have named here as dinner tip. So basically in this particular module, what happened? In file two, just look at the CSV first. So assume this is uh, your data for a particular restaurant. Okay, so this is the overall bill that you have to pay. This much you have added as the tip. Okay, this much. Uh, this is the gender, smoker or non-smoker on which day that particular person came. It was the dining and size. How many people were there? So basically, depending upon these, this three weeks of data, when I run this entire chart, see what happens. Okay, uh, it is. OK, sorry, I have not imported the libraries. Libraries are imported and run it and there we go. You can see here this all manually can be executed. Yellow, green and all those color stuff and all it can be executed. Or if you want to understand if, if the if this scatter plot is not clear to you, some people like me can understand this. Uh, this kind of chart. Some people can understand the bar charts. Even that can be done. So on Fridays and Mondays. Thought, uh, those uh, restaurant servers got the maximum tip over here. This is how basically now this is all dynamically generated data with the help of the required classes. Even the pie charts can be executed. Now I have created this particular code, which basically it has taken several pro uh, current programming languages and the popularity level. This level can be increased or decreased depending upon your own interest. When I run this entire code, you can see here I can simply get this kind of. Simple dynamic chart over here. Which is showing that okay, Python is the maximum. Another way of doing the same thing. But in the exploded manner, check this out. So these type of things actually can be implemented. You can add new things over here. You can simply add each and everything that you want and simply play around with it. This is all happening due to the live data. Maybe you want to save it. Just click on this, save this figure and you are good to go with it. OK, so these kind of dynamic 
directly generated data can be simply implemented. Now, if you want, like for example, menu based content you want. So if I run this code, this shows me two things on the web browser. See here, I have the scatter plot and then I have the bar chart. Earlier, what I was doing, I executed two different uh, panels or two different code, one for scatter, one for bar chart. Now what I did, I, I took the same thing, but showing it in the same format only. This is the beauty of the data visualization in Python. Seriously, this is very less time. Otherwise, I could have simply shown you how to basically work with each and everything, how to create your own code in whatever way you want and how to basically play around with it. But this is very fun, believe me. When you know what exactly you are doing, when you know what you want for your implementation, then actually it becomes very easy. I was working on one more code, but it didn't work out as expected. Actually, I was thinking for uh, the heat wave for years, uh, for last five years of data so that it can show, okay, uh, from uh, Kanyakum, uh, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, all the states will be listed in an, in an image and uh, based on the month wise, uh, where it was more heat and it, it was less, uh, more cold. Temperature based uh, image I wanted to create. But this code is not completed yet. I'm still working on it, so soon it will be uh, done. But basically, this is what you can do. Once you know what you want, actually you can write codes for it and then play around with that. And then finally, when you talk about the module six, so this is all about machine learning. Okay, for this, for machine learning, you should be basically knowing the Python. You should be knowing mathematics specifically mean median mode that, that you have studied uh, in 11th and 12th class. OK, all those things are needed. And basically based on that, machine learning is all about how your machine learns. With whatever you have right now, the best example for machine learning is your YouTube. You all watch YouTube channel. You all uh, do shopping. You look at one single video on YouTube and then you automatically un understand you watch one or two videos automatically. YouTube will start recommending similar type of videos, right? How it is happening? It's all learning machine is learning that. Okay, so and so person is actually uh, interested in Sufi songs or ABC songs or English songs or whatsoever it is. So basically machine learning is all about how your machine can learn and basically improve itself. To put it in simple words, if performance of doing a particular task is improved with the experience for your machine, that is your simple definition of machine learning. Okay, so here I have written a code which basically finds the accuracy of uh, some data which I have triggered over here. Generally, when I run this code, it imports the data and then it gives the accuracy how much accurate my data is. It's 1% accurate. In the same way, if I keep on running, it, it grows practically and then the data will also change over here. But it is going to take some time because it is a very simple program which I have written. OK, so this is about. All the modules that we have to discuss now. One more thing before we uh, can wind up the session. I told you that one additional uh, one bonus related uh, thing. I will be showing it to you later on. Now we all use teams, right? We all are having uh, teams uh, app installed on our machine. When you do not use teams for a long time, what happens? It changes from active to. Unavailable state, right? If you remember. So in that case, how can I make sure that my uh, machine always remains active even though if I'm not in front of my machine? How actually I can do it? So basically it can be done with the help of a simple Python program. For that you have to install the PY auto GUI and then simply run this particular code. What this code will do, 
it will randomly move your mouse after every two seconds. You don't have to sit and then do that man uh, that managing manually. It will do it for you automatically. Have a look. So when I run it, check. My mouse after every two seconds will move automatically into random places. Because line number six and line number seven are giving the X coordinate and Y coordinate, which is randomly getting generated, which is which is randomly generating the coordinates for me. And basically it is moving accordingly to that. This is one of the simplest thing bonus part you can say which you can do. Now if you look at if you summarize the entire module in single shot, your Python is able to perform any operation locally on Internet on websites on applications. It can create your own applications. It can manage your own application. It can manage your own softwares. It is currently my Python program is actually currently interacting with my mouse and still it is moving it automatically. If I, if I want to kill it, then I'll come back over here and press control C. And you can see it says keyboard interrupted. This is how it works out. OK, that's the end of uh, six modules and uh, guys don't worry about the content which has been uh, shared uh, sorry which has been shown over here i will be sharing all means my team will be sharing all the recordings they'll be sharing all the pptes pdfs recordings uh, the scripts which i have executed over here okay so don't worry about that you will be getting anything and everything including the questions which i have told you you all will be getting a PDF. You will be getting the uh, five questions. You'll be getting 15 days or 20 days. And based on that, you can revert back to us. OK, my team will decide and in the email itself, you will get the last date. And then based on that, whoever clears that particular. Uh, all the tasks which I've given, then based on that, we will be assigning the certificates to everyone. OK, we'll be emailing all the certificates to everyone. 